good day. We're back today and we're going to do a little bit more on a learning session. So today we're going to be talking about why do I need legal documents now? Now, what I'd like you to do is throughout the presentation, I will be trying to go back to some of the Q&A and the chats and the messages that come in, but I definitely will circle back to those at the tail end. The other thing, if you can take and do a quick snapshot on the chat, you will see that I'm going to be posting these on the YouTube channel at this point going forward. So if you came in a little bit late, um, you know, or you missed part of the presentation, you'll be able to go back in and see those relatively quickly, along with some other topics. Now, if you have a chance, I'd like you to go into the chat, and if you would put in, I'd like you to describe eggshell for me today. Now, I know that sounds like a little bit of a, an odd question, but you're going to see why. So, again, type in the chat, eggshell. If I ask you, well, what is eggshell to you? And that's a question I'd like to know. So, we're going to go ahead and, and get started. I'm Amy Rose Herrick. I am a, char a chartered financial consultant. I am also America's profit building specialist. So, you could really ask me anything about money that is on a business or a personal basis and I am your go-to authority for those type of things. We're gonna go ahead and do some screen sharing now so I can get right into the presentation and we're glad to have you with us. All right, now when we start talking about why do I need legal documents now? Of course, this is something that most of us know that we need, but we kind of ignore that. I always give a nice little disclosure and that these concepts are for a general audience. Now, you may have some unique dynamics that you need to seek out and talk to your own advisors, but along with this presentation, this should be pretty eye-opening and give you an opportunity to have a safe place to ask questions, or this might be something that sparks your attention. So, you know, why do I need them? I know many of you look at legal documents and you can start getting confused because we're going to talk a little bit about a will, a power of attorney. Sometimes that's called a POA. A medical power of attorney could be an MPOA. What about a living will? What about a trust? What about a trustee, beneficiaries? There are so many different terms. And if it isn't an area that you're familiar with, by the time we finish up in a little less than an hour, you're going to know much more than you have before, and it will help enable you to start putting your own plans in place. Now, there may be some of you watching that have dual citizenship. In those situations, I really feel it's important for you to coordinate your activities with the attorney in the jurisdiction that you live. For example, that could be the U.S., and then the jurisdiction where you own the other property or assets. Let's pretend that you own property that is in Greece or is in Mexico. They will have their own estate planning rules and you'll need to coordinate your estate planning to take into account the jurisdictions where various property or accounts may be held. Now, I believe everyone over the age of 18 needs at least a couple of these documents in place. And in some cases, because we've got young people who have already started businesses, they've got YouTube, they have got monetization on those, they are running a small enterprise, they, even in the younger ages, probably need a will, especially if they have significant digital assets, which is not something that many of us think about as being a valuable asset, but it definitely is. Now, this is an actual post that I received from a, a lady named Dawn. Okay, how much more can one woman take? A month ago, my middle son dies. I have custody of his four-year-old son, and I'm painfully hearing my grandson tell me how hurt he is because his dad's pregnant girlfriend doesn't care to be a part of his life anymore. And what am I supposed to say? And now St. Francis, that's her employer, is possibly closing and I'll have no job. I'm at the end of my rope and drowning fast. My life is feeling hopeless. It's the worst two months of my life. This is the broken heart of a mother who lost a son who was in his very early 20s, totally unexpected. And of course, because we often think we're invincible, there were no estate plans, there was no life insurance, and this is a catastrophe for the entire family going forward. I am hoping to impress upon you that for those of us who have adult children, we need to encourage them to put legal docu 
treatments in place, especially if there are grandchildren involved, so they are not vulnerable, and at the same time, coordinate our efforts. These are family conversations we need to have. What happens if I have a disabled family member and they can be of any age? Well, this is something that we're gonna talk about a couple of ideas. And I really like this particular quote that I'd found. I am not broken, I am beautiful. I am different, not less. I am challenged, not challenging. I'm not a burden, I am blessed. Cerebral palsy is not a choice, but acceptance is. And I could substitute anything in there for um, aging is not a choice, but acceptance is. Alzheimer's, we could have any other medical condition, um, residual car accident injuries. At this point, now we could even throw in COVID, which has changed things. So we're going to talk about some ideas when we've got an incapacitated or a disabled family member that we need to protect. Have you ever heard of a special needs trust? Well, a special needs trust is set up to enable an individual to have access to funds that would not affect any aid that they may already be getting. Let me give you an example. Let's pretend that I have a, uh, a 30 year old autistic son and he is getting a financial assistance and he is getting aid. But if I was to leave a $200,000 life insurance proceed to him, he could lose all of that aid until he had gone out and provided documentation that all of that money had been spent in order to requalify for any type of financial aid and understand programs can change. And what he qualified before, if they change the dynamics, he may not be grandfathered in or, or qualify at that point. If I took the $200,000 and I put it into a special needs trust, then he does not have access to the money. But the trustee, whenever there is a need, perhaps my son needed a special shoes that had to have special sole inserts. Well, that's not covered or he's not able to pay for that with the resources he had or, or some other instrument. Maybe he needs a wheelchair, I don't know, but the special needs trust could take care of those items that his assistance does not. What happens if my son passed away and there was still $100,000 left in the trust? Well, as the grantor, you would have the ability to designate who was to receive those funds at your son's death, if any existed. Maybe you pass that out to a family members, or maybe it was passed out to charity, but you can determine what happens with those proceeds. And we're protecting the particular family member who has a disability or incapacity, and we're also preserving the wealth for future generations potentially. But the key is that we're taking care of that person's needs. So I hope that makes sense. Special needs trust. Now there's also guardianship. One of the things I highly recommend is those of you who have children who have challenges or disabilities, you need to make sure that you have established guardianship well before they reach the age of 18 and technically on paper that they are adults. So you need to consult an attorney for your jurisdictions to determine what are the best steps that you could take. Now, a conservator might be dealing with the preservation of assets that this individual has already received. What about respite care? You know, we have some of our family members uh, or our friends who are carrying great loads because they are the primary caregiver for someone who has an incapacity. Now, what we can do in those situations is we can put a plan in place to give the caregiver a break. And in some families, uh, you know, I'll just pull one out of the air. What if we have one family member who is doing primary caregiving for a disabled mother? They're living on premises, so they pretty much take care of the doctor's appointments, the medication, the care, the bathing. I mean, it's a big load, and they're able to do this. However, by that person doing those tasks, they are freeing up every other family member to do whatever it is they need to do, work, take care of their family. But what if there were four children and each one of the three children took the weekend? So one weekend a month, 
you showed up and you were there from Friday afternoon until Monday morning to give this person a break. What if you took one week of your vacation and allowed them to take a break? So we've got to do some respite care planning. We also have to have plans in place that if our primary caregiver is in a car accident or has an illness herself, that someone else can step in and they've got some instructions to be able to do that smoothly. And that respite care ties in with that contingency on a caregiver plan. If you don't have that, now's an excellent time to put something like that in place. I touched on the special needs trust and I'm gonna reiterate that this can be for a person of any age or any sex or any incapacity that there may be. So don't, don't ignore this opportunity. Yes, it costs a little bit of money to set it up, but you know, multiple family members could put money into the trust if they so chose. It's an option that I don't always see used often enough. Now there are special words. You see the revocable and irrevocable? They are not the same. A revocable trust means that I can change my mind at any time. I can add provisions, take provisions away. I could disclose or I could close out the trust. Irrevocable means that I have written this essentially in stone. It cannot be changed. When you're dealing with these documents, you wanna be very careful when you're reading the title of them that you understand whether it is revocable or irrevocable. So now let's talk about a will. What does a will do? Well, basically a will just passes out your stuff. And if you don't have a will, you really do because the jurisdiction that you live in has already created a will for you and it has provisions that you may or may not agree with. Now, for example, if I didn't have a will and I had a spouse and I had uh, four children, my jurisdiction may have indicated without a will that one third of my assets go to my spouse and the remaining two thirds would be divided between my children. That may have not been my intention. I may have thought my spouse would get it all, but that's not true. If you haven't written a will and you're gonna dig your heels and you're gonna refuse to write a will, you ought to at least know what your jurisdiction requirements are and what has already been set up with you because you have lost control of your assets if you refuse to take that step. Now there's a common misconception that your will is final and overrides all other legal documents. And that is not true because a will is not the only way that you can pass assets at your death. There are other tools that we can use. Now, when we look at a will, it is a testamentary document. That means that it comes into play after your death. Now, there are non-testamentary documents. Now, a non-testamentary document is something that might be called a transfer on death deed. We're going to talk about that for a minute. You may also have a transfer on death set up on your vehicle. What are the advantages to using some of these non-testamentary documents? Well, it comes down to you can avoid the probate process. It also reduces your probate cost. I'm just going to throw this out here. It's just a number, folks. Let's pretend that your estate was $200,000 between your cars, your house, um, a mutual fund, whatever the case may be, it's $200,000. Well, I tell clients estimate around five to 7% for attorney's expenses. It could be less, it could be more. Now on that $200,000, that could be anywhere between 10 and $14,000 just for the attorney. Everything is subject to credit or claims. So if you have credit card bills or medical bills, anything else outstanding, they can petition the estate to be paid. All of those things are going to happen before it would ever get to the point in your will that those assets would be distributed to your heirs. So, you know, what's, what's so convenient about the non-testamentary documents? Well, they don't require an executor to handle your wishes. There is no probate court, but they are still valid upon a person's death. And again, as I mentioned, they will override anything that's in the rule. Think of about um, whenever you have a, a chain of command, even in a business, you know, you have the president of the company who might be over the vice president and down the line. Well, non-testamentary documents, specific ones will override and will take precedence over anything in a will. 
Now, a will, even if it has conflicting terms, cannot override a transfer on death. Cannot do it. If that is registered with the uh, recorder of deeds on my home, and I have listed that my house is to go to my daughter, but the will says it's to go to my son, it will stand that it goes to my daughter because of the hierarchy level. Now, for a transfer on deed to be applicable, uh, there can be more than one owner. It could be an individual owner. But what happens sometimes when you start reading some of these things, it gets very confusing. I may have two people who own the property, and we're going to call one of them A, and we're going to call one of them B. And I'm going to walk you through this for a particular reason. If we go down and we look at our example, for example, transfer A declares designated beneficiary B, whereas transfer C declares designated beneficiary D. If A revokes his interest, only B is affected and C's interest for D stands. And by this point, you're already glazed over. Make it easy. Whenever you see words like this, I'd like you to put actual people's names in. Now, you do not have to use A, B, C, and D because the names in your family may be different. But in this case, Albert and Carol own a property together. That's pretty clear. Albert declares Barry as his transfer on death for his portion. Got it. Carol declares Danielle as her transfer on death for her portion. Pretty simple. If Albert revokes his interest while living or by will, giving it to Carol, Barry gets nothing at Albert's death because Carol now owns it all and Danielle is not affected because she is just the transfer on death for Carol's share. So I hope that made it a little easier, but sometimes when you're looking at statutes or forms or some of the others, this is a way I have found it to really helps with clients. Now, in order to do a transfer on death deed, you have to be the designated beneficiary is subject to all encumbrances. So I can't just give my son the house and the mortgage is not going to go away or if there are any tax liens or anything else, just because I used a transfer on a death deed, all those things will still have to be paid. So as part of our estate plan, we need to determine whether he could pay the house off with life insurance proceeds or other cash on hand. Do we need to consider that he would have to refinance the home in order to be able to retain it? He cannot do any of those things, even though the house has been transferred, it may make it much easier for him to sell the home quickly and to retire those debts. But Let's go back to my $200,000 example. If we put the house into the estate, then, and the attorney and the probate process had to put the house up for sale, we've got to work it through the estate process. The attorney would still be entitled to the ten to $14,000 for handling the transaction. So any equity that was in the home also vanished or our ability to lower a price to be able to still pay the mortgage may be compromised. So we still need to do some due diligence here, but it can be an option for you. Now, simply filling out the paperwork for a transfer on death deed doesn't make it valid. This has to be recorded and it needs to be on the books before your death so that this instrument can be enacted. Now, if you fill out the papers and you put it on the shelf, it's a useless piece of paper. But there are a couple of things with that. Now, if you die before the document is put in place, it's invalid. doesn't matter. It also has to include all legally binding language. So in many cases, you will consult an attorney. Some jurisdictions have a simple piece of paper that you can fill out and add with the, the title and you don't need an attorney's help but that's going to be dependent on your jurisdiction. So spend a few moments in that area to get it right. You do not have to notify the beneficiary that you have put them on the deed as a transfer on death. Although I would highly recommend that you do that because when you start the estate settlement and discovery process, and you've got a will, and again, this may conflict with what you've done on the transfer on death, it makes it a neater, cleaner, faster transaction for everyone 
because immediately after your death, then whoever you have named as transfer on death beneficiary could get a copy of your death certificate, take their ID and go and very quickly change the title on the house. They still have to deal with the estate issues if it has to have a mortgage against it or anything else, but that process can be very, very quick. And you cannot transfer a property that you do not own. So for example, I could not go down and do a transfer on death deed for my neighbor's property or for my mother's property that I thought I was gonna inherit someday. You have to own the property. And I know that sounds very, very silly. Understand we are dealing with human beings and sometimes they make mistakes or they don't think all the way through the transaction. Now, when you do a transfer on death deed, often this is something that you were thinking of later in life, although it can be done as soon as you own a home, there's no reason to wait. I don't want you to be under any pressure to make this kind of a decision. And if you do feel like a family member is pressuring you, you need to consult an attorney, you need to speak to a trusted family friend or another family members. But I will tell you, for some of you that are a little bit stubborn, it may be that your family member is trying to put some things in place because you refuse to take care of it. We can see what's coming. It's gonna be a major train wreck. Maybe you refuse to put a will in place because, well, I've told her what I want to happen and we don't care what you told us. We know what the law is going to allow us to do. So don't be pressured, but at the same time, be wise here on what's the catalyst for this. Now I'm gonna go ahead and let's go back here and I'm gonna take a quick look at and see if there's anything new that has come up over in the chats or in my q and A. I've got a couple of things on the q and A. Hello, Jerry, glad that you were able to join us. Can I do a will on my own without an attorney? Well, you know, that's an excellent question. The answer is yes, you can. There are some individuals who will go online and depending upon the jurisdiction that you live in, you can buy will kits and you can fill in the blank. Do I recommend that you do that? The answer is no, because in any jurisdiction, there may be very specific language that you need to have, or you could invalidate the will or the provisions that you are doing could conflict with what your jurisdiction's laws are. And, and let me give you a valid, a real example. Let's say that my example of the jurisdiction says that my spouse is entitled to one third of my estate and the children are two thirds. Well, in my will, I gave the children 100% and I left my spouse out. Well, my spouse can contest that will because they were entitled to at least one third. It may be a good, simple guide to help start the conversation, but you don't want to write a will yourself that is going to be invalidated because of what you didn't know. But that's a great question. And then, uh, Jerry, a second question you've got. Can you explain if simply the difference between a trust, deed, and a will? All right. Uh, trust, I am an individual. Jerry, you are an individual. A trust is like a separate entity and it has a very specific job that it is supposed to do. We create the entity and we direct what the entity will do. Now, I hope that makes trust easy. Now, a deed, a deed is something that I will say is on something tangible, property. Property is tangible. I could go stand on my land and on that land, I may build a house or an apartment building or it may be a vacant, but a deed is a tangible piece of property I can stand on is maybe the best way I could explain that. Or I could see on a map if I've never visited it. And then what about a will? Again, a will goes back that we just covered that a will goes ahead and it makes sure that we have passed out our stuff. It is not the only way that we can do that, but that's one of the ways that we can do it. So we're gonna go ahead and go back into our presentation here. So excellent on the questions. So now let's talk a little bit about a, we wanna go to the current slide here. Well, maybe it doesn't wanna to go to the current slide today, but that's what we're gonna do. 
Now we're going to talk about transfer on death beneficiary for your vehicles. And you may have not have thought about that. But remember when I mentioned to you, there are things that we can pass outside of probate and the will process if we choose to. And in some cases, uh, depending upon the way we title and work assets, we may have absolutely nothing to probate because we passed it all out, which avoids that entire process and it uh, avoids the creditor claims, it avoids all of those things. Now a transfer on death for a beneficiary of vehicles means that at my death, I have put this on the title to the vehicle and this vehicle will pass to the person of my choice. It is not subject to creditor claims, but if I have a loan against it, then I need to pay that. It's very specific um, to the vehicles. So, you know, I couldn't do a blanket one and say all my cars, no. I'd need to go down and say, you know, this particular vehicle is to pass to Mary, blah, blah, blah. This vehicle, I can pass it to Mary, but vehicle number two, maybe I pass over here to George. So this will be done on each vehicle that you own, and they only receive that property, the vehicle, when you pass and it's at your death. Now, if I have a vehicle that had two owners, I'll use my example of my spouse and I own a vehicle. We can still do the transfer on death on a vehicle. It's just that both of us have to pass away before that person would receive it. Now, an interesting thing that you may not think about as a vehicle, but in many jurisdictions, they will consider any watercraft as a motorized vessel or a motorized vehicle. And if you have to have a title to it, chances are you could put the transfer on death. And again, you check with your jurisdiction. So if you had a boat, to jet ski, I'd love for you to have a yacht or anything along those lines, you may also be able to pass those assets outside of the probate process if you choose to. Then we've got digital assets. And if you have a will that is an old will, you probably have never even addressed digital assets. Digital assets are a little bit different. You know, many of us uh, use Facebook pages or you've got websites, maybe you've got a YouTube channel, uh, Pinterest, all of those types of things. And what usually happens is because of the agreement that the owner of the account has, as a part of those pages and pages of things you never read when you write and you push in, I, I accept. They already have a contingency plan built in at your death. It may not be the plan you wanted, but this is one of the reasons when there is no plan for who's going to take over these assets that meet the criteria of the institution who actually owns it. See, Facebook owns your account. You just get to use the platform there. That is why some accounts you'll see up for years and years and years, and they're never shut down because no one has the ability or the authority to do that. Now, there are terms of service, and what I generally suggest is that you reach out to that entity, whatever it is, and there are often forms that you can fill out that you can appoint someone to take over the account or to manage it as a third party if you were incapacitated. Isn't always something you think of, but there are cases where families definitely want the accounts to stay up. There are cases where they definitely do not. This is a way that you can do that. Now, when you name your personal representative for anything that has to do with a digital asset, it can be anyone. It could be your executor, an administrator. It could be... Uh, your son, your daughter, your spouse, and your designated recipient could be any of the above. I really wouldn't recommend a charity because, see, that really doesn't make sense for that person. But usually you want what I will refer to as a live person. And a very good practice, you want to inform your loved ones in advance of who you have chosen as your fiduciary and those type of things so that they know copies of the forms, you know, how have you done this? It would be a good idea to put them with your legal papers. I think it's an excellent idea to have a lot of these on the cloud where people can access because generally we access legal documents during a crisis. Something has not happened that any of us are happy about. Now let's talk a little bit about a power of attorney. Now, a power of attorney gives someone you trust the ability to manage your financial affairs for you. And that can be just a little bit different because I'm going to give you an example of a baby hummingbird. 
Now, most of you know what a front door is. Well, if on your front door, I got a drill and I drilled a hole in it that was only big enough for a baby hummingbird to go through head first with the wings closed, had to hop through, which would be difficult. There is really not very much that's going to get through that hole in your door because I've specifically designed it for that baby hummingbird to go head first. Now, a limited power of attorney, I may say that my Bank of America account, ending in one, two, three, that my brother George can make deposits and write checks for my bills. I have really dialed down what he can do. I did not say he can take cash out of the account. I only said that he could make deposits and write checks for my bill. So do you see like a baby hummingbird how tiny that little hole is? Now I could have an unlimited power of attorney. Let's go to a much broader scale. All of us have either driven on or on TV, we have seen a multi-lane highway. Let's say that it is six or eight lanes across. It's a big highway. There's a lot of things moving over that highway. And if I had a semi-trailer truck, I don't know, there was an ice storm. And that semi-trailer truck is now parked, not going forward, but completely sideways. And it is blocking four lanes of traffic at this point. Wreck whatever has happened. Well, did I mention the highway is a little wider than that semi? It may be that we could drive around the right side of the semi or the left side. It's going to slow us down, but we can still get around the obstacle. Now, if I had a little short car, maybe I could drive underneath it or a motorcycle on its side, but I sure wouldn't want to do that with ice. And then, you know, for some of you, it will date us. If you ever watch the Dukes of Hazard or some of the movies, you know how they go up those ramps and they just fly those vehicles over the top. Okay, maybe you could use a ramp and you could leap over the top. But my point is that even if you're slowed down a little bit, that semi is not going to keep us from our destination. And with a power of attorney that is unlimited, there are no restrictions like we had on the limited power of attorney where it was only for a bank account. Now, when you do an unlimited power of attorney or with a limited, you have to make some decisions about whether you want to have a triggering event. You know, I need to be declared incompetent by at least two physicians or it is in effect right now. And so if it is by two physicians, sometimes that can be a little tricky. If you say by my primary care physician, well, what happens if you have multiple physicians? What if your primary care physician is not available? What if you cannot get two doctors to agree? Now, I have seen instances where it looked like it was probably a relatively short-term incapacity, but there were some issues happening that had to be dealt with that had to do with the sale of property. But the doctor was only comfortable signing that letter for 30 days and then reevaluating the patient. Very difficult. Now, you could have a power of attorney that said that, you know, effective right now, that person could go down to the bank and they could withdraw money. They could do anything they wanted. So you want to be very careful about how you set these up. But you have the choice. Do you want it really narrow down? And maybe you need more than one power of attorney which goes into my next comment about if you own a business, do you need a business only power of attorney? Maybe that gives your partner the ability to have your voting shares or to make decisions that uh, sign checks, whatever it is that you're not able to do. So if you are incapacitated, you are injured, you are ill, and we need to invoke this, give someone the authority and who has the wisdom to be able to step into your business and make prudent business affairs. And I really see this one not used as often as it should be. Now let's talk a little bit. Um, I'm going to step back. I don't see anything else in the Q&A at this point. So I'm going to go and, and look in a second here. A medical power of attorney. Now in a medical power of attorney, we talked about a power of attorney for your financial affairs. Well, a medical power of attorney is a completely separate document. And that gives, again, the person that you trust the ability to make medical decisions when you cannot do so. Let's say that I was in a uh, terrible auto accident or I've had a stroke and I cannot, I'm not conscious then the person who has my medical power of attorney would be able to authorize surgery, decide between treatment options, whether I would be transferred to another facility, 
And with these documents, I think it's very important that I mention on these that I really want you to go three deep. I want you to have your primary person that you want to make decisions. Well, what if they are incapacitated, they are unavailable because they're on a once in a lifetime cruise in the, in the Caribbean for the next three weeks, or they have passed away and you haven't updated your documents. I don't want that document to be worthless. Who's your second choice? If they're not available, who's your third? Maybe you'll go fourth, but go at least three and make sure you pass out copies of these documents to the individuals that you've named and they know how to get in touch with each other. In my perfect world, because I'm on the other side of the table receiving these at times, I love to see things that say like, my brother, George Smith, date of birth, January 22nd, 1952. Last four of his social are one, two, three, four. So if George can produce for me, his driver's license, he can produce something that I know that this is George, especially if we're dealing with significant assets that you had in mind. Otherwise, I've had situations where it's like, look, I have never met you. I don't know you for sure, but you're supposed to be his brother. I would like you to show me your parents' um, marriage license. I'd like your birth certificate. I'd like George's birth certificate and some other pieces to prove that this is that person. So that's just my own personal little caveat there, but I'll throw it out. Now with a living will, this usually goes hand in hand with the person who has your medical power of attorney. You are giving the instructions or the guidelines of what your preferences are. If I wanted an armed guard to keep my husband away from the plug of every machine that kept my chest going up and down and kept my blood circulating, then I'm going to have a pretty detailed living will or medical directive that I want life sustained at all costs. The flip side of it is I may say, you know what, I do not want to be resuscitated more than twice. If I am not going to recover, I'd like to, you know, let me go peacefully. I do not want to be artificially sustained with feeding tubes, but I do want water. And you are welcome to harvest any organs that someone could use. You get to make these choices when you are not able to speak up for yourself. The other thing I think is a really wise idea is once you put these documents in place, it makes sense to pull them out every year or two and to re-sign it, redate it, add a paragraph to it, you know, I still agree with the provisions. What if you had, I did not want to be resuscitated and some other things, and you were in the middle of cancer treatment, and you no longer agreed with some of those provisions? You may need to update it, but those are real-life family situations that occur. Now, when we have transfer on death on pay on death has a place too. Now, when we have a uh, transfer on death, I want you to think about some of you own mutual funds that are not retirement accounts, and you also probably have stock accounts. Well, behind your name, whether it's a, an individually owned account or joint, we can put transfer on death. Now, transfer on death means that at your death, you have designated where these assets are going to go. On the current law at the time this was filmed, if you were to transfer on death mutual funds or stocks, your beneficiary also gets a step up in cost basis. Um, that's something you want to talk to a tax person with, but I'm going to put that out that that is a true advantage. Now, pay on death is for assets that are cash. Think about your checking account. Think about your savings account, but these are not retirement accounts but they are indeed pay on cash. So if a person was on my bank account and has, P, has POD for pay on death, at my death, they could show up to the bank with my death certificate and identification, and they could receive the assets, do whatever they wanted with them. It will not go through the estate. It is not subject to creditor's claims. And if that was something I wanted to do, then that would be important to me. Uh, a caveat, I have run across only a few banks that will not do this. And I'm going to just put out to you, if I had $100,000 in the bank and they would not do a pay on death account for my accounts, and that meant that it was going to have to go through the estate, and I did not want it to go through the estate for the attorney's expenses and everything else, it may be worth it to me to change to a bank who would honor that because of the significant savings 
that I will have to my heirs and to execute my wishes. Now, oh, we do have another question. So I'm going to back out of here real quick and we'll see if we can't answer that. And thank you for your, um, well, shoot, maybe we will, maybe we won't. I can't get it up, folks. Come on. Well, I don't really want you to see that. We're going to stop sharing for just a minute and see if we can get this back up. You know, we love technology when it's working, and we really don't like it when it's not. Let me see if I can go in here. You know, I'll just do the Q&A on it. Um, can I use one general POA to include medical and financial issues? And the answer is yes, you can do that. But if you are going to do that, you usually have to be very specific. I think it's a neater, cleaner transaction in order to do the two separate ones. I mean, that's my own personal feeling there. And the reason that I say that is because I want nice, clean lines. And I may have an individual who would do very, very well working on my financial affairs, but uh, but they are not the individual that I want to go in and to handle my medical affairs. Maybe they are not the best choice for me. And you can tell that this is not scripted, folks. So I'm just a real human just like you. All right. So we're going to go back to a revocable trust. I can change my mind. I touched on this word earlier. If you have a revocable trust, you can change your mind at any time. It gives you a world of flexibility. Now, when I use the word irrevocable, rarely can I change my mind. Sometimes there are ways that we can get assets out of the irrevocable trust, but it usually means that you have to, the trust has to sell them and all of the proceeds from selling the asset has to go right back into the trust. So we're very careful between the words of revocable and irrevocable. Now I wanna hit the word cohabitating households have special circumstances that need addressed. Now I think most of you, when you think about cohabitating households, you think about a couple, you know, a, a, a romantically involved couple, we'll, we'll put it that way. So if you think about cohabitating, that's probably the first thing that comes to your mind. It's not the first thing that comes to my mind as unmarried partners, although it's the first thought most people have. Let's talk about some other situations. We can have a grandmother and a grandson that are sharing the same residence. We can have roommates. We can have two sisters, a mom and a daughter. We can have some other arrangement. But what I have found is whatever happens to your cohabitating person, your roommate or relative is going to happen to you. If they do not have their legal documents in place, it's going to be a mess. And what if you're sharing expenses or you're splitting the rent or whatever the case may be, if they do not have the mechanisms in place, this could be financially devastating for you. And there is no way for you to rectify the situation. Anytime that you have a cohabitating household, I'm going to encourage you to make sure that you have these discussions on a roommate. Hey, if you get sick or lose your job, do you have money and savings that you can float the rent for the next couple of months? If the answer is, oh, no, you need to know that, especially if you co-sign the lease because you will be responsible for it. What happens if I have a grandson living in his grandmother's home while he goes to college in another city that is several you know, hours, if not states away from where his family is and grandmother passes away? Does he have a right to stay in the house for a period of time? Is all of that up in the air and that's now gone? What's the conversation? What if grandma is just sick? Does he have access to her checking account to go ahead and make the payments for the property taxes and to pay the utilities and things until grandma can get well? I don't know, but these are discussions that you need to have. I'm going to touch briefly on understanding the impact of account titling and account ownership differences. Now, I had asked you earlier to describe eggshell to me. 
And when I think about eggshell, I wanted you to just think in the back of your mind, when I say describe eggshell, what is that? Some of you may have looked back and you say, well, eggshell, it's, it's, it's that thing that's around an egg. Most of the time it's white. And when you break it, well, you know, the, 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 the egg yolk and the other thing, you know, it comes out of there. But eggs are not always a certain color because we know that when birds lay them, they can be blue with black speckles. They could be brown. They could be solid brown. They could be a little pink, a little green. So when you ask about describing an eggshell, it might be that it goes along the realm with the most eggshells that you're familiar with. And I know you're thinking, where are you going with eggshell? It doesn't seem like it has anything to do with the topic. Well, it has everything to do with it. I saw this cartoon a long time ago, and I just loved it. This isn't exactly what I had in mind when I asked you to paint the walls eggshell. I think she was thinking, oh, probably a light off-white color. It's just a guess here. But for many of you, the way you've titled your assets, you have made sure that it may not match what you had in mind. When we go to the easiest one of all is an individual account. And I'm going to just use what I will call this average family. We've got three generations here. We've got mom and dad. We have their two children who each happen to have a child age. So we'll call them the normal family, whatever that is. But it could be just as normal that it was a single mom and she had children. It could be just as normal that we have a single dad. Whatever it is, this is just a fictional family that we're working with. Now, if on the account it says John Q. Jones, John owns it all. His wife and no one else has any access to it whatsoever. John passes away, that asset will be paid into his estate because no one else owns it. It does not say TOD or POD on it. And his wife, even if they've been married for 55 years, will have to have this go through the estate before she could have access to it, including paying his bills, attorney's fees, and everything else. So that's an individual. Now, if we have John Q and Jane R. Jones, that means either one of them have access to this account. And it doesn't mean they own it 50-50. It means either one of them could walk in on any day and add money or take it all out. And they do not need permission of the other owner. Now, let's take it a step further. In many cases, you'll see John Q and Jane R. Jones with joint trust with rights of survivorship. Now, this means that they own all of the account together, but when one of them passes away, the other individual owns 100% of the account, hands down. Joint trust with rights of survivorship. You often will see that on the title to a property for a home. That might be a place that you see it too, or a mutual fund. It just depends on how the title is, but that's what JTWROS Joint Trust with Rights of Survivorship. Now, we also have another one that's called Tenants in Common. Now, Tenants in Common is not the same as Joint Trust with Rights of Survivorship. John Q. and Jane R. Jones, Tenants in Common. And then I have one, John Q. and Tamara, Tenants in Common. And you'll see where I've made just a little bit of boxes here, you know, to show, you know, who owns it. Each one of them own 50% of the property. Now, if it's a house, you know, you can't really cut the house in half with chainsaw and say one side's his and one side's hers. But what you can do is you can take this and you can say, oh, can't talk right now. You can take this and say, well, we own it together. But at my death, my half of the house, I can designate who receives that. Now, I could designate that the owner with me receives it, my partner, or not. I may choose who their no, new partners would be. So if you own a property, tenants in common, uh, for example, perhaps your parents passed away and they left it to you children. Well, tenants in common may not be the best arrangement for you, but that's what it means. It may not be of what you intended, it's not what you intended. Can you fix it? The answer is absolutely yes. Et al, I only see on really old titles, and usually these are ones that nobody wants to touch because they are just like um, toxic waste. Somewhere down the generations, there was a piece of property that was divided. Maybe it was the grandparents that gave it to their children. 
and then their children um, had interest in it, and then their children passed away, and they left it to their children, and then their children, one of them passed away, and now it's the great-grandchildren. I, I saw one that there were about 134 fractional owners on this one section of land, and it was ugly, and nobody wanted to touch it. But when you see at Al, I'm telling you, waiting longer is not going to make this situation smell any better. Et Al stands for and others. So in this case, John Q. Jones et al. means that he owns this property with others. Who are the others? I don't know. You're going to have to go down and do the research on the deed to find out who the others are and if it designated what percentage or if it is that they are all owned it equally. And if any of them passed away, then it just starts a chain reaction. So if you have an et al. property, I'm telling you, please go take care of this now. It will not be any cheaper or easier to do later. Now, the other one that you might see very common is called um, John Q. Jones with Mary Jones's user. Now, a user does not own the account. John owns the account. John is financially responsible for the account. Even if Mary said, oh, I'm going to charge this and I'll pay all the payments off of it. That's an agreement between you two. That is not an agreement with the issuing institution. John will have it reported on his credit report, whether Mary makes the payments or not. He is responsible for it. Now, what if we have a different one that is transfer on death? We talked a little bit about that one. So transfer on death, I can take an asset and I'm going to reiterate it again so that I can transfer this asset outside of probate. And you are talking about mutual funds and stock accounts usually, but we know that we can do that with the titles on our property and vehicles too. What about pay on death? We mentioned that is usually a cash type account like your checking account, a savings account, a CD, a money market. But we can have these assets go to whoever we want and it's outside the probate process if that is our goal. What about for the benefit of? Well, now we've got Jane R. Jones for the benefit of Lily Jones. Well, Lily happens to be this beautiful granddaughter down here, and Lily is obviously a minor. Well, Jane is managing these assets for Lily until she reaches an age of adulthood in her jurisdiction. Jane cannot spend the money on herself. That is not Jane's money. It is Lily's money. So for the benefit of means that you are managing that for another person. Generally, they're still a minor under a specific age in that jurisdiction. Now we have another one that is Jane R. Jones UTMA for Lily Jones. Well, UTMA stands for Uniform Transfer to Minors Act. Again, she's merely managing these assets until Lily is an adult. And an UTMA is usually assets that are stocks or bonds. An UGMA, U-G-M-A, Uniform Gift to Minors Act, is going to be your cash assets. Maybe uh, grandma gave Lily a CD that is at the bank. So UTMA and UGMA, you have someone who is managing it until they get a little older. Now, in the addition to that, we've got to deal with the beneficiaries. Now, our beneficiaries, in this case, using the same family, we have John, and he made his primary beneficiary his spouse, Jane. Now, he could name more than one person if he wanted to. That's up to you. And then as contingent beneficiaries, he happened to name his two grandchildren. He did not have to name his children. He could have named a charity or anyone he wants. I highly recommend that you have the primary beneficiary and a contingent beneficiary on your accounts. These are usually going to be like your IRAs, 401ks, your life insurance, your group life insurance. If you do not name a contingent beneficiary and your primary beneficiary passes away, that money will automatically be paid into your estate. If it happens to be a large IRA or 401k, you can create an enormous tax bill up in the 40% range that has to all be paid and probated and attorney fees and credit uh, claims before it could ever potentially reach what your beneficiaries are. So don't miss this step on your assets there. 
Now, there's another thing that I want to teach you. Many of you do not realize that in order to maintain life insurance as tax-free, that we want to avoid what's called an unholy triangle. And it's really simple. We want to have two points of the triangle on the key components in the life insurance match. We never want three that are different. And it's very easy in some ways because we know that we should never have the insured be the beneficiary. If I am the insured and I pass away, I certainly cannot receive the money as a beneficiary. So that one's very, very easy. But when I go down, maybe I have Jane who is the insured so that when she dies, the proceeds would be paid out. And that Jane is also the owner of this particular policy. So I have two points of the triangle that match and John is the beneficiary. Wonderful. John will be able to receive these proceeds tax-free because two points of the triangle are the same. We could do the same thing if John was the beneficiary, but we made John the owner of the policy. For some estate planning purposes, we do not want the insured to own the policy because we don't want this counted as an estate asset. You know, maybe they have a four or, or 10 or $20 million policy. We do not want that in the asset of the insured uh, estate because it could trigger estate taxes. So there are reasons. But if we name John as the owner of Jane's policy, we want to name a contingent owner if John passes away first. So the contingent owner can take possession of the policy. It will not be a part of Jane's estate. And the new owner can name the new beneficiaries. And we want that to happen relatively rapidly. And this is a mechanism that we can do that. So now let's talk about that unholy triangle that I touched on. When we have all three that are different, we have now created a taxable event that you never intended. If we have John as the insured, and we have Jane as the owner, we messed up when we made the beneficiary the grandchildren. This is the same, and let's pretend it's a $500,000 policy. It's just a number. What we have done is that Jane is the owner of this policy, and she controls what happens with this asset, and it just happens to be $500,000 of life insurance. Jane never touches that $500,000. It all gets paid directly to her grandchildren. Because Jane made a gift to her grandchildren in excess of $15,000 at the time this is filmed, the remaining proceeds are going to be gift taxed. And Jane, the one who gifted the money, is responsible for paying the gift tax, even though she doesn't have a dime of that $500,000. Now, there is a way that Jane can claim this against her estate, but she needs to talk to her tax professional to have something filled out. Don't do an unholy triangle. And if you are a business owner and you are watching this, this is something I really have to look at within the companies when I deal with it, because many of you have got things set up incorrectly and you are making sure that money gets paid into the business and the corporation that's going to be taxable and it is going to cost you enormously. So this is something you need to check on. Now let's talk a little bit about a per capita. When we're talked about beneficiaries, there are some words that I like you to put behind that. And per capita means that it would be divided amongst your living beneficiaries. So in the case of a, whether it's a primary contingent and I put you know, um, John Q. Jones per capita, that means John Q. Jones has to be living to get the money. And if he is deceased, that money will then revert to the other beneficiaries. It will not go to his children. However, if I wanted it to go to his children, if he passed away, and this is a way sometimes that parents can assure grandchildren receive their inheritance, then I would put the words per stirpes behind his name. And in my example, let's say there were four kids, and when I passed away, I had had it all to be divided equally, but John passed away and I had per stirpes behind his name. Then John's share would then be divided equally between his living children. What if John didn't have any children? 
then it would go back to the other beneficiaries. But do you see how I'll call it? What's my plan A? This is what I want to happen. I want John to have the money. But if John passed away, here's my plan B. This is what I want to happen. And we can do that. And we don't need to involve, you know, attorneys, the courts, but it's filling out our paperwork correctly. Very important. Now, how account titles impact your estate and credit report. Now, when an owner dies and leaves assets to heirs, it is a taxable account, such as a 401k, an IRA, there are other deviations if you work for nonprofits like a 403b, 457. But think of it this way, you received a tax deduction at the time the money went into the account. Whoever spends the money, whether it's you or your beneficiaries, they're going to pay taxes on it. Very simple. Now, when you have the word Roth, in front of the IRA or Roth in front of the 401k, you received no current tax benefit because the money put into this account was already taxed. Now, whether you spend the money or the beneficiaries spend the money, that will be tax-free. There are a few little caveats. It depends on your age, if it is your money, on how long you've held it and what your, um, and what your age is at the time you distribute it. But if you are a beneficiary of a Roth IRA or 401k, there are no um, holding periods or restrictions. And we're not, I'm not going to go into that here, but that's a, an individual conversation. Now, if you have a tax deferred annuity, this is purchased from an insurance company, and this is not your retirement annuity, you have put money in that you've already paid taxes on, and that portion will come back tax-free, but any growth on the account is going to be taxable. We have another item that is a survivorship pension. Generally, when an individual has a survivorship pension, at my death, the amount of the pension, whether it is a, the same amount or a smaller amount, will go to my spouse if they are living for their lifetime. Once in a while, I can name another family member, but it's rare. Now, that money on a pension is always taxable to the person who receives it, whether it is the original person who earned the pension or if it is their survivorship beneficiary. Now we've already talked about life insurance and we know that if we set it up correctly and we avoid that unholy triangle, then it's not taxable to the beneficiaries. The other thing is when should you use an irrevocable life insurance trust? Who should own the policy? How much life insurance is enough? These are other conversations that can be very uh, estate specific to what your situation is. But it's not uncommon when we have life insurance policies that we have multiple policies that are owned or we have different beneficiaries because they are doing different things. Or we may need something for a short period of time, but we don't need it forever. Two quick methods. I have the wish method. If you are trying to decide how much life insurance you wanted, you grab a piece of paper or you type it or put it on notes on your phone. How big does a check need to be? Well, what do you want it to do? Do you want it to pay off the house? Do you want to have money for estate settlement and funeral costs? Do you want 50000 each for the kids in a college fund? Do you want to leave 200000 to charity? I don't know. But that is a wish list method to determine how big the check needs to be. The other method that I use commonly is 20 to 30 times income. And let me use an example. If I earned $50,000 a year times 20, that's $1 million. And some people will balk and say that's way too much life insurance. I disagree. If I invested that $1 million and I earned an average of 5%, you may get more, you may get less, that merely replaces my $50,000 in wages into the household. I still probably have to pay house payments. I've still got to do health insurance on all of those things. I may have lost a 401k matching. So 20 times earnings, I'm generally looking to replace the income. And then we're going to have to have cost of living increases over time. So at some point, usually within the first couple of years, unless the earnings are high enough, we're going to start invading principal, which is going to reduce the earnings. Now, 30 times income often comes into play when I have a disabled or an incapacitated family member that you are the primary caregiver or you are financially responsible for. When you can document those types of things and insurance companies will often go up to as much as 30 times income 
because there is a recognition of the value of the care that you are giving. And if you are not there to do it, then we're going to have to pay someone to pick up and take up that role. Well, how much heirs do tax pay on taxable inheritance? I don't know. What's their tax bracket? Think about if I gave my IRA and my daughter was already making $150,000 a year between her and her husband's wages. Well, they're already in a tax bracket from those wages. If they were to pull out $100,000 from the IRA, that's the last dollars coming in the door. So that's probably going to be taxed at a higher rate. It all depends upon your beneficiary situation. I would estimate easily 10 to 40%, maybe more, depends on where they live because some states have state income taxes that would also have to be paid in addition to whatever the federal income taxes would be on that account. Do you talk to a tax professional or a financial advisor before you pull the money out of the account? My recommendation is yes. It may make sense to pull it out all at once. It may make more sense to pull it out systematically over a couple of years to eliminate the highest tax brackets, if at all possible. Remember our little cartoon? This isn't exactly what I had in mind when I asked to paint the walls eggshell. And we've gone through a lot of things today about uh, wills, trusts, and now I'm going to go back into some of the questions and answers, and we're going to um, exit this screen. So we're going to stop doing the screen share and see if I've got anything more. I don't have anything more that are in the, the Q&A. So either I've answered your questions or you're just overwhelmed at this point. I hope that's not the case. And uh, Jerry, I really want to say thank you because you know some people are a little afraid to put the question in but I promise I don't bite I never have and then over in the chat uh, there were a couple of things if you want to recapture that one of the things folks that I'm going to be doing going forward because I've had so many requests when I do the classes that you can't make it I will be taking these recordings they are going up now on a YouTube channel if you will copy that, or if you will put my name in Amy Rose Herrick and do a search, you're going to see the library is going to start being built so that you can come back and you can watch the session again, or you're, you know, feel free to share that link with someone else. So they'll be able to benefit from this information that we have got available. Now, if you would like to book a call with me, and you know, discuss whether I could be a good fit to help you because there are a lot of interlocking pieces. You are certainly welcome to do that. And I have put the link there. I will also go ahead and put that in the notes along with the video on YouTube. It would be really helpful to me if when you've been watching, uh, Jerry, you especially, if you would like to put something over in the chat on some comments on if this was helpful to you, if it had new information, if this is something that you would like to come back in the future, that would be great. Uh, the other thing, oh, I forgot to put that in. Um, if you do Facebook, if you will go to The Secret Profits on Facebook, you will see, uh, you go over to the tab that says more, and then under more, you will want to type uh, you will look under events and then under events, you will be able to see the classes that I am putting into the calendar. I have already put them in through March, but I don't think they're all showing up yet. And you will be able to get the link to go ahead and register for other classes. So if this has been helpful to you and you would like to see other topics and they will be, you know, all over the board please feel free to access that resource and feel free to follow me on Facebook. I also put announcements and things that are there on what I have available. Do we have any other questions or comments at this point before I go ahead and exit? You've been very gracious and I try to keep it close to an hour, but if I can squeeze a few questions in like I did for Jerry, so it makes it more meaningful, I like to do that. So we're going to say, um, give it just a couple of minutes here to see if you want to take a minute and put anything into the chat for me. I would appreciate that. Before we do a going once, going twice. 
All right, we're gonna go three times. Thank you so much. Please feel free to reach out to me. And one last thing I will put into the chat box there is my email address. So if you've got a comment and you'd like to add it that way, that would be great. Have a blessed day.